Good evening, everyone, and welcome as the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston hosts another exciting program. My name is Marianne Maldonado, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome and happy holidays to all of you. The Republic of Korea is the sixth largest trading partner for the U.S. It's the third largest trading partner for Texas and the number one destination for U.S. LNG. Today, we're going to explore the current state of our alliance and what opportunities we see past the pandemic and into the future. First of all, I'd like to welcome and thank the Consulate General of the Republic of Korea in Houston. Consul General Ahn is helping us support our program this evening, and I invite him right now to make a few warm welcoming comments. Consul General. Thank you very much. This is uh, Maldonado. Um, well, good evening, everyone, and good morning to Ambassador my namesake. Nice to see you. Uh, my, I'll make just a few remarks, very short. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank World Affairs Council of Great uh, Houston for working with us to organize today's webinar. It's always a pleasure to work with you, World Affairs Council. And thanks to Ambassador Ho Yong An and Ambassador Kathleen Stevens for taking time to participate as speakers. I think the timing of today's webinar is fortunate. The change in the U.S. administration is uh, around the corner. And I am of the view that change does not come alone. It always comes together with opportunities to make things better. I hope under the Biden administration, Korea-U.S. alliance will become stronger. And uh, let me stop at this point and turn to listening mode. And back to you. Uh, Mrs. Maldonado. Thank you, Consul General. Before we begin, let me remind you of some of our upcoming programs. We are excited to close out the year with some truly phenomenal programs, and I want to make sure we highlight some of these events for you. Next week, we are bringing to you uh, Sailing True North with 10 Admirals in the Voyage of Character with former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, Admiral James Stavridis. And then also next week, don't forget we have our Council Cabinet Holiday Soiree and our Global Connections Program with WAC Board Member and Partner in Charge of Jones Day, Houston, Lyle Gantz. Then in January, I want to make sure that you uh, get on your calendar some amazing things we've got lined up for you for our 2021 programming. We are going to have early in January a program on the defense priorities under President Biden, and that will be held in conjunction with Secretary Robert Work, the former Secretary of Defense, and Richard Fontaine, the CEO for the Center of New America Security. Then we're also having a program on the battle for Pakistan with former director of the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council. And our showcase event for January is going to be on January 27th. You won't want to miss when the council has the honor of hosting the ambassador of Saudi Arabia to the U.S., Her Royal Highness, Princess Rama bin Badar bin Sultan bin Al-Budaziz al Saud. I hope I got that right. So learn more about all of these programs on our website at wachouston.org. Now it is my pleasure to bring to you our program this evening. We are honored to have Ambassador Ho Young On. He is the current president of the University of North Korea's Korean Studies, and previously served as the Republic of Korea's ambassador to the U.S. He has also served as Deputy Minister for Trade, First Vice Foreign Minister and Ambassador to the European Union. Ambassador Ron studied international relations at law at Seoul National University, Georgetown University, Korea National Open University, he has a number of degrees, not to exclude Georgetown Law School. He also received an honorary PhD in political science from Kunnam University. 
Joining us also is Ambassador Kathleen Stevens. Her career has served, she has served as the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Korea and was the first Korean language speaker and the first woman in that role. She currently serves as the President and CEO of the Korea Economic Institute of America in Washington, D.C. During her career as a Foreign Service Officer, she served on the National Security Council staff, as well as numerous senior positions at the Department of State. Since 2015, Ambassador Stevens has been the Williams J. Perry Fellow at Stanford University, where she teaches classes on U.S. foreign policy, diplomacy, and U.S.-Korea relations. Joined by my colleague, Ronan O'Malley. Ambassadors, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Marianne, and uh, thank you all again to our audience for joining us, all the members and guests and teachers and students, and especially I thank you, a, a wonderful warm uh, thanks again to the, the Consul General here in Houston, and especially the, the Consul General on, uh, for supporting what we do here and, and realizing how important the nature of, of helping Americans, Houstonians in particular, have a better idea of what's going on in the world and also the U.S.'s role in the world and also how important uh, key alliances are for the United States. In particular, here tonight, I'm delighted to discuss uh, our alliance with longtime powerful alliance with the Republic of Korea. Um, and, and just for any of you who may wonder, uh, Republic of Korea, South Korea, um, uh, so just if, if you hear the two names used interchangeably, that is what we're talking about. Um, so I just want to thank you, Ambassador Ahn and Ambassador Stevens. Thank you both so very much for coming tonight. Uh, we're primarily going to talk this evening about the current state of the alliance and what are the initial kind of, you know, issues that are on the plate, uh, especially for a new administration starting in January and, and where we go from there. But maybe just because it is such an amazing story uh, and maybe uh, Ambassador Ahn, I'll ask you to maybe touch upon the economic side of it and Ambassador Stevens maybe on the de democratic side of it. Uh, I think a lot of people may not realize the incredible success story uh, probably Korea or South Korea has been. Uh, since the 1960s through the 1990s, it had one of the most unheralded and most impressive uh, rates of, of, of you know, economic increase, about 9% increase every single year, uh, to become one of the major economies in the world. And then beginning in the 1980s, became a, a great uh, democracy as well. Uh, like every democracy, changes of, of administrations of some issues here and there, like we have in our own country. Um, but I think really has become a model both economically for the world and, and with regards to democracy, especially for a neighborhood where you share a border with obviously a very complicated uh, regime in North Korea. And you're extremely close to the, the massive powers of both Russia and China, who, um, you know, at best are perhaps not the most democratic from time to time. So maybe Ambassador Ahn, could you just very quickly uh, walk us through how it is that uh, South Korea made such a massive economic change? Thank you, Mr. O'Malley, as a matter of fact, that is my favorite question. And thank you so much for starting with, with my favorite question. But before I answer your question, let me first briefly greet your, your members, members of the World Affairs, Affairs Council. I have to tell you this, which is, I used to be a Korean ambassador to Washington from 2013 to 2017 for a little more than uh, four years and four months. And at the time, I had, not, had an opportunity to travel to all different cities in the United States. And one of the things which I really, really enjoyed was to meet with members of World Affairs Council. So it is such a pleasure to meet with you, with you this morning in Seoul and then, and then evening, evening in Houston. Well, with respect to Mr. O'Malley's question, then let me try to start with some numbers. And then the number of this, which is I joined Korean government service back in 1978. And at the time, the per capita GDP of South Korea, it was $1,300. World average that year, uh, 17, uh, 1978, was $2,000, which means Korean per capita GDP was $700 short of world average. In other words, Korea used to be one of the poorest countries in the world. The time I joined Korean government service. Today, it is one of the seventh, seventh most, uh, most uh, say, richest country in the whole world. How did it happen? And I think of course, it happened because Korean, Koreans worked very hard. And then I remember reading a cover story in the Newsweek magazine 
I think that, that was back in 1970s. And what, uh, it was a cover story on Korean, go- Korean economic growth. And what it said was that, well, maybe Koreans will be the only people who make the Japanese look lazy. <laughs> I, uh, I, I found, found that description so interesting. <laughs> but I have to tell you this, which is we work hard, but at the same time, we benefited enormously from something called liberal global order. When I say liberal global order, that it means free trading system, human rights, rule of law, you know, get WTO, et cetera, et cetera, which in fact was designed and supported by the United States. So I, I think they were the two most important factors which made it possible for Korea to come all the way to, to where we are here in such a short period of time. And then over to, over to Kathy for demo, democracy part. Uh, well, thank you, Ambassador Ahn, and, and thank you, Ronan, for it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite questions, too. I, I like Ambassador Ahn, I also have to add my thanks for inviting me uh, to, to join you. I wish we were there in Houston with you. Uh, left out of my that very generous bio by Mary Hopefully Ann. next year. Yes. Hopefully next year. Mm-hmm. I left out. I, I actually, I have Texas born. I should have put that in my bio mm-hmm. I sent to you. Um, mm-hmm. But I've only gotten to know Houston in recent years and just how international a city it is and how important it is, not only to Korea, but but to the U.S. and its place in the world. So it really is great to join you. Um, I'm going to a- answer a little more personally I, uh, uh, because I think Ambassador Ahn has, has, has set the table well. I, I, I first went to Korea in 1975. So three years before Ambassador Ahn uh, uh, became a diplomat, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Korea. Actually, I think at that time, the GDP per capita was $600. So even in three years, it went from 600 to 1200 or whatever, whatever it was, change was happening. And But the Korea I knew in the 70s, as Ambassador Ahn said, was a very different place. It was rural. It was uh, people felt uh, it was tough. It really surprised me how tough it was. Um, and I think that when you think about what spurred, the question is, how did this happen? First of all, I want to say, even though I know the Korean government sometimes calls it or some of the miracle on the Han, I don't think it was a miracle. Um, I think I, I saw with my own eyes, uh, not only the kind of hard work that went into it, as Ambassador Ahn talked about, but also just the determination, the determination I saw in Koreans that out of the Korean War, out of a terrible century, you know, that of course began with Japanese annexation and, and then war and then division, they were going to build something. And yes, it was wonderful as an American to feel that we were also a part, an important part of this project. But there was a tremendous determination I saw and the Koreans I knew as a Peace Corps volunteer that they, the lives for their children were going to be better. And then what happened is this was not just about just getting money then. And I actually went back to Korea as a young diplomat in the 1980s and I, I was covering Korea's domestic politics. And Korea's domestic politics at that time were very, very rocky because it was still an authoritarian regime with no clear path to democracy. And over the 1980s, Koreans found that path to democracy. But again, it wasn't easy. It wasn't a miracle. It wasn't inevitable. I think the U.S. played a positive role on balance, but it was not a decisive role. So, uh, but I do think, and I'm glad you asked the question this way, that while, while South Korea's extraordinary economic rise and the power it holds economically, I mean, is, 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 so, uh, is, a, is, is, is so remarked upon, its political journey is no less remarkable. And the combination of its economic and democratic rise has allowed it then to be the kind of country, you know, that I find young Americans know now, not just Americans, but people around the world. Uh, you know, the country of K-pop, the country of great public health practices. We could go on, and I'm sure we will. But I will never forget in the 1980s seeing what, again, looking back, it may seem inevitable. It was not. It was not. And that's a, a, a longer story, which I think is very relevant to all of us all of us about how you not only have to struggle sometimes for your democracy, but you have to struggle also to keep it and to improve it. Well, thank you, uh, both, uh, both of you. And, uh, you know, as Marianne noted at the beginning of the event, uh, we're hosting uh, Admiral Shepard as a former Supreme Commander of NATO next week. Uh, but in terms of key U.S. military alliances, I think a lot of Americans think of NATO, think of Europe, they think of, of, of the, you know, the Warsaw Pact and what it with Russia. Yeah, you know, thankfully it never it never got too hot. But obviously, uh, for our allies in in Asia, 
Uh, we had the, 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 you know, devastation of the Korean War. And, you know, ever you know, since then, South Korea has been an incredible partner and alliance uh, for the United States through the Cold War, through everything since then, all the challenges since then. Um, could maybe to start with you, Ambassador Ahn, could you tell uh, Americans help them understand, uh, for one thing, you know, the, the Korean War obviously didn't end an official peace treaty. We have an armistice, so in, in essence, we're still technically, there's been no resolution to that. We'll discuss that later. But can you talk about the mutual defense treaty and, and what it means for both the United States and uh, Korea in terms of uh, military commitment? Well, Mr. O'Malley, I was listening to Marianne, and then she was talking about your future programs, and then said uh, Admiral Stavridis would be with you, as well as uh, Secretary Walk would be with you. And then I have to tell you in, in, uh, that, in fact, they are very close friends of mine. How did it happen? Because I used to be ambassador to the European Union. And at the time, I, in fact, was attending NATO meetings as well. When Admiral Stavridis was uh, uh, something called Sakhir, Supreme Allied Commander for Europe. And then he, in fact, he and I, in fact, uh, wait, wait, just hit it right away as soon as we met. Why did it happen? I think it happened because, because of the alliance. The alliance goes back to 1953. So this year, it is about uh, almost about 70 years, 70 years old. But I call it 70 years young. Why do I say that? It's because after almost 70 years, it is so strong. It is appreciated on both sides of the of the Pacific, both in Korea as well as in the United States. So the question will be why? And I think first, it is because we live in a very tough world. And I used to be a young diplomat in 1990 in Washington, D.C. when the Cold War came to an end. And Mr. O'Malley, you would, you would still remember what the Francis Fukuyama, historian Francis Fukuyama used to say at the time, end of history for him. It was not just end of uh, the, 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 the Cold War. It was end of ideological confrontation. And then he said, uh, from here, hereafter, then, then there is nothing but for humanity to live happily on and on. That, that, in fact, is what he thought back in 1990. That's, in fact, what many people thought at the time. After 30 years, unfortunately, we come to find we, in fact, live in a very tough world. And I think that... First and foremost is the reason why uh, this alliance is so much appreciated on both sides of the Pacific. But at the same time, I think there is one more thing I have to say about, about the alliance between Korea and the United States in the sense that, well, it was concluded in 1953 and so many things happened. I mean, I mean, we talked about economic uh, development of Korea. We talked about the dem democracy taking root in Korea, et cetera, et cetera. And during all those, and the Cold War came to an end. During all those years, Korea-U.S. alliance somehow succeeded in adapting itself to the changing environment. And then only through adapting itself to the changing environment, it still remains relevant today. And then when I say changing, adapt itself to the changes, then we have to think about Korean participation in the Vietnam War, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. At this very moment, Korea and then the United States, we are cooperating with each other through our fleet deployed at the, at the Gulf of Aden. So it's a global partnership, literally global partnership. So those two things, that is to say, we live in a tough world. And then somehow we, in fact, have been, have been worse, very successful so far in adapting our lives to the changing environment, which makes me to think that's something we must keep on doing in the days to come. And, and maybe, uh, Ambassador Stevens, if you could follow up that with uh, specifically from the U.S. perspective. Um, could you talk about, uh, I suppose, the ongoing military commitment to Korea? Um, you know, it, it varies slightly, but the, the average number of, of, of combat troops that are deployed to South Korea at any you know, moment in time. And also what our commitment in terms of some people might hear about the nuclear umbrella and, and what the United States is truly committing to with regards to protection of Korea and vice versa of Korea, you know, taking part to defense of the United States. Yeah, uh, well, I think uh, Ambassador Ahn has set the stage very well in terms of talking about the way that uh, the alliance, and, and by the alliance, in this case, I mean even more than the purely military or security aspects of it, but the whole relationship, the partnership has broadened and deepened over the years uh, in so many ways. But I think it is important, as your, as your follow-up question to me suggests, Rodan, to also uh, kind of emphasize that 
Right. This was a, a, a security, a mutual defense treaty that was signed uh, right after the armistice was signed at the end of the Korean War. And actually, if you look it up, which is easy to do, right, uh, it's very short. I mean, lots of pages have been added since, but it's very short. And basically, it was there because the South Koreans were worried that even though there was an armistice, that if the U.S. left, they might be left to the tender mercies of Kim Il-sung again and of North Korea. And there might be renewed conflict. So that treaty was a commitment by the United States, first and foremost, to continue to defend uh, and ensure the survival of the Republic of Korea, which is also underpinned by the United Nations in many ways, but led by led by the United States. So um, that, you know, in a way, unfortunately, that remains important. Uh, there still remains, uh, you know, it's a different kind of threat vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis North Korea now, but it is still there. And as you say, it also now, or you imply, uh, extends, well, I'm sure we'll get into it, to the, uh, uh, the, the nuclear and missile threat uh, that uh, has, has grown as North Korea has developed its programs. You know, it's a great tragedy in many ways, because this is also, this is, this is an alliance with one country, a divided country against the other half. So it's complicated, too. You know, I don't, it's, it's, it's a very complex thing. I don't think any Korean, certainly, again, when I first went there in the 70s, I don't think Koreans imagined that the country would still be divided 70 years later. And it's a tragedy, not only divided, but also not reconciled, that we'd be still in this, this, this period of tension. So there's a great sense, I think, that this, the fundamental, the raison d'etre of having this defense treaty is more relevant than ever because there's unfinished business. Despite all the success of South Korea, there's this unfinished business. And at the same time, there, there are other issues in the, in the region and in the world. And because of this relationship that we've developed based on shared sacrifice, based on now shared values, we work in these other areas too. But yes, it remains important uh, that uh, the security commitment is there. The number of troops, US troops there, has changed not only in number, but in character over the years as the threat has changed, as South Korea's capabilities have grown tremendously. Uh, right now, it's around 27,000 US troops uh, plus a variety of civilians and others who support them. Um, there is, as you, as you, as you rightly uh, highlighted, Ronan, Ronan uh, um, uh, uh, extended deterrence, which is a you know a fancy word, I guess, for uh, uh, making it very clear, publicly clear, that uh, that the United States uh, extends its nuclear umbrella and, uh, to to encompass South Korea, our ally, and we are prepared to defend it and want to make that known. Uh, and of course, all of that has been tested in recent years, uh, as uh, as we've seen tensions rise and fall, uh, but rise in, in, of course, especially in 2017, but also in some earlier periods uh, to, to quite high levels over the years. And sometimes this has taken the form of nuclear missile tests more recently. Sometimes it takes the form of attacks on, on, on South Korean uh, uh, forces or, or, or in contested areas in the sea. So, so the, the sense of, of needing to be, uh, continue to deter, continue to send a clear message that the United States is going to stand with the Republic of Korea is extremely important. And a true presence is one way, but it's not the only way. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think there's any magic number or magic, but it's, it's something on which the, over the 70 years, I think the two sides have, have through, different administrations on your side and we've just we we're, we're we've had a rather unconventional approach in terms of approaches to alliances and troops abroad and so on in the trump administration but even through all that there's been a kind of an institutionalized view and i mean that in a good way that uh, we have a commitment here we're going to meet that commitment we can have conversations about how we share the burden about how we deploy our troops about what we say but we need to work together to make sure that the message is very clear and that the commitment is strong and, and before we move on to just kind of the current topics, um, maybe Ambassador Ahn, if you want to go first, then Ambassador Stevens, are, are either of you concerned that beyond perhaps maybe traditional political leanings, people, if they're leaning left or right, you know, whether party they might affiliate with in either country, their support for the alliance and military might, might vary. But maybe beyond that, the possibility of generational differences that, you know, the younger generations of their 20s and 30s now um, they may not, they didn't have a parent who fought in the Korean War, or even they met themselves made up for the Korean War, like some of the, the older uh, members of, of both societies in the United States or Korea. Are you concerned in either country about convincing uh, the younger generation of the dire need for this military alliance and the need for both countries to stand behind it? 
Or Mr. O'Malley, as a matter of fact, uh, there, there, there in fact is certain generational differences in Korea. But at the same time, it is, it is very difficult to, to, to explain in the sense that we're somehow talking about support for, for, for the alliance between Korea and the United States. Overall figure is around 70%. And I think it is very interesting because the, the overall figure for support for the alliance in the United States is around 70%. And then it is, it is also around the 70% in Korea. So this is a good number. But at the same time, as I suggested, looking into geographic, uh, I'm sorry, demographic composition, there is certain generational difference. And then as I already said, I think it is very difficult to, to explain why it is happening. But uh, to, to put it rather bluntly, it is rather strong among people in their 50s and above and people in, in, in their uh, 30s and below or 20s and below. So, well, again, I, I really uh, do not think it is easy for me. I have my own ideas, but at the same time, I think it will be taking a lot of time to explain it away. But what I think is this, which is, well, we can think about all different ways why it is happening there. But I think definitely uh, the more they, uh, they in fact understand about what is happening in the security environment around the Korean Peninsula and what is happening uh, in, in the security relationship between Korea and the United States, then, then I think people just come to, un the more they understand it, the more they support it. So that, in fact, is the reason why this kind of event is so important. For well, citizens of uh, the United States, in Houston, for example, understanding what, what is between Korea and the United States, and then the, the more they understand, I think the more they support it. I, that's what I'm trying to do back in Korea as well. And then Master Stevens, a, like a similar perspective in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I mean, well, I would say in the U.S., uh, actually polling indicates that, um, that in American public opinion, kind of across the board, geographically, generationally, um, there's a good deal of, of support for uh, the notion of alliances uh, and, in particular, an awareness of South Korea and what it brings to the table. Um, it, you know, it's, it's not 100%, but it's, it's, it's higher than it's ever been. And I think maybe somewhat paradoxically, perhaps, but uh, that, that may be, in, well, I think it's in part because of South Korea's uh, a greater visibility, again, as a soft power uh, exporter, you know, and again, I, I, uh, when I talk to people under 30, I guess I'd say they're more likely to know about Korean drama or K-pop than they are about the Korean war, but they're really interested. Um, or Korean food, for that matter. Um, uh, but, um, but I think all that affects public attitudes. But the other part, which I said maybe is a little bit paradoxical, is, is given that, that we've had over the last several years in our political discourse uh, in this country, you know, some questioning of, of what does the U.S. really get out of alliances? Uh, are we carrying other people's burdens? Um, it's, I think it's elicited a discussion. I've certainly been involved in a lot of them. Uh, and uh, I think uh, on the whole, the the and obviously we're a big country. There's a lot of different opinions, but uh, when it comes to Korea, um, there's kind of a sense that yeah, maybe there's some adjustments we made and so on. But this is an important partner. And the other factor I, I think that's important, uh, which maybe you'll get to later, but um, if, but I'll mention it now. And both in the United States and in South Korea is China. And as China uh, uh, has become more assertive, more aggressive, more challenging of of some of our values. Um, Notwithstanding the fact that I do want to say in South Korea, I think there's also been some concern about some things that have gone on in the U.S. and some things have been said here. There's a, there's a little bit of worry about being left to the tender mercies of China, if you like. Um, and, and so I think there's a sense of on both sides that, you know, we've got an important thing to work together on. We, we may not see it quite exactly the same way. We have, you know, very different geopolitical situations and, and other, other interests, but we, we, we have a, a kind of a common concern. So I, I think that's also um, kept the, the support, if you like, and the understanding of why this relationship is important higher than you think it might, might have been given all the other, uh, uh, you know, sort of ups and downs we've seen in our, our politics recently. I, final point, though, I think there is some worry, and maybe, Investor, I think there is some worry in South Korea about U.S. commitment, you know, that for all the things that, that Ambassador Ahn and I are saying and you're saying about, we all know this is really important, there is a little bit of a seed of doubt planted that, well, you know, could that just change? So I think that is a bit of a challenge uh, for uh for the for, for the for the alliance, not just in in, in Korea, but but you. Mr. O'Malley, may I add a point? 
to the last point which has been made by Ambassador Stevens, which is uh, certain concern being expressed in certain corners of the Korean society about U.S. commitment to, to the alliance. Well, well, as a matter of fact, I think it has a lot to do with the, the presence of U.S. troops in Korea. And one thing we have to remember about that would be, uh, to put it rather bluntly in just one single word, that would be the risk of miscalculation. Miscalculation. And then I'm talking about the outbreak of the Korean War back in 1950. And, well, don't take me wrong, I have such high respect for Dean Ek. And then he, in fact, wrote a book, his autobiography, called Present at the Creation. And I consider it one of the greatest books ever written for the diplomatic history of the United States. But at the same time, his name is somehow always closely associated with something called Atchison Line. And then Atchison Line, in fact, was, uh, was the declaration by, by Secretary Atchison about where defense lines, defense perimeter for the United States force in Northeast Asia. So, so it, in fact, according to Edison at the time, it was Aleutian Islands coming down to Japan, coming down to the Philippines. And then it, it exclu ex excluded the Korean Peninsula. And later on, many people were, were of the view that as a matter of fact, that uh, declaration by Dean Edison, it in fact made Kim Il-sung, made Stalin, ma made Mao Zedong, to get into miscalculation that United States is not committed to the defense of South Korea, which in fact was very wrong. But at the same time, I think that in fact is a very important message we have to keep in mind, which is, well, when you think about the, 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 the significance of the presence of US troops in Korea, one thing we must remember is, where well, crucial role played by that would be to remove the chance of miscalculation on the part of hostile powers. Well, thank you, Ambassador. And to move on to, you know, I suppose the two biggest topics on the table for any discussion regarding uh, the Korean Peninsula. Um, you know, Ambassador Stephen mentioned China for obviously for both the United States and, and the Republic of Korea. China is the number one trading partner. It's the largest you know population uh, country uh, in the world. Um, unlike, you know, the, the years of the Cold War, Russia was not an economic power, but it's a it's a it's a country both the United States and the Republic of Korea must cooperate with. But that relationship, at least from the U.S. perspective, is perhaps changing from a cooperative to maybe more strategic relationship. Um, maybe uh, Ambassador Stevens, if you could talk about, I suppose, what from a U.S. perspective South Korea means with regards to our approach to China, and um, you know how you feel that the reliance can be used to, I suppose, some ways. Um, I don't want to say, uh, you know, work with China or manage China, but but to deal with the issues that are, you know, rising with China. I mean, obviously, threats, you know, militarization of the South China Sea, um, increased economic presence and influence and political presence in many parts of the world. Obviously, there are human rights concerns within China itself. Could you talk about the U.S. Uh, and Korean approach to China? Yeah, I mean, it's a big topic. And, and uh, I, I would say this, I, you know, I mean, obviously, China, Korea is a... a it has China as its large neighbor, as you, as you say, a very important trading partner. And also South Korea needs China, if you like, if there's going to be progress towards peace and reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. You know, so they have, uh, and, and so does the U.S. Uh, but I think these are all things that are deeply felt in South Korea. Um, uh, South Korea has directly felt uh, the kinds of pressures that China can bring to bear uh, if it uh, uh, wants to drive a wedge uh, between Washington and Seoul, which it would like to do. I mean, China's been pretty explicit, and this is nothing terribly new. They're just more overt about it now, that they think that alliances are, as they say, a, a vestige of the Cold War. And so I think they do look for opportunities, and they found one a few years ago when there was a, a new missile defense uh, uh, system that was uh, uh, placed in South Korea uh, by the U.S. with the cooperation agreement of South Koreans. And the Chinese imposed essentially economic sanctions on South Korea. I mean, with kind of plausible deniability, but basically South Korean firms, the South Korean economy paid an enormous price. 
So it's a reminder, this is also, this is about the economy too, uh, as well as security. And uh, so, so I think one, I, I guess I, there needs to be an appreciation in the United States that these are very existential, existential questions, both on the economic as well as security front for South Korea. But two, um, I think there's a lot that South Korea and the United States uh, can do together, that we already do do together. And I think the Biden administration will look to do more. I think it was unfortunate that on some of the steps, whether one agrees with them or not, that the Trump administration took to try to address some of the trading practices that we uh, that we we wanted to push back on in China, that instead of enlisting allies like South Korea and for that matter, Japan and others to work with us on a common approach based on a common rule book and kind of common values of rules of the road, um, South Korea and others became kind of collateral damage. Uh, you know, that they got kind of sideswiped side by some of the same things that we were aiming at China. So I would hope that why I think what we can do and what we should do is take more of, if you like, a multilateral approach to, um, to, to addressing uh, some of the areas where we are in disagreement or competition with China and where we, where we want to try to ensure that our vision, where I think there is a lot more shared, much, much more shared ground between South Korea and the United States than with China, where we find a kind of a common roadmap to go ahead on that. But that will, you know, that does mean that the United States has to, has to accommodate, if you like, some of South Korean sensitivities as well as South Korea, you know, taking into account what's important to us. And I, I don't think that, that that's been, uh, uh, flushed out as much as it might have been over the last few years. And Ambassador Ahn, I suppose, you know, a similar perspective as, as Ambassador Stevens noted, for the United States, North Korea is extremely important, but for obviously for you, um, it's an existential question. Uh, uh, sorry, not uh, saying China is an existential question. Um, it's 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 w w how is the issue, I suppose, viewed in, in uh, probably Korea, and, and what do you feel, or do you feel the US, United States could do more to kind of understand and I suppose work with your perspective in regards to China? Well, Mr. Omar, this, uh, this uh, relationship between the United States and China, which is basically based upon more on competition rather than cooperation these days, that I think is a reality. And I think one of the most important questions for ministries, ministries, ministries of foreign affairs around the whole world, not only Korea, but also in the whole world would be this, which is, this is a reality. I mean, let us just start from, from where the relationship between the United States and China is located now. What do we have to do, uh, given it as a reality, where do we have to position ourselves in, in, our, in our relationship with the United States and in our relationship with China? In Korea, I think there are two different kinds of uh, views, schools of, schools of thought. One view is, something called uh, West strategic ambiguity. That is to say, let us not just come up with any given position. Let us just play it by the ear, just piece by piece, case by case. That would be the safest way, way to go. That, that's something called strategic ambiguity. And then there is another school, which I would call more principled, principled approach. And then I belong to that principled approach. But by saying principled approach, we have to tell both the United States and to the Chinese, yes, economic relationship is, it is, is important. Yes, China can play a very important role with respect to, for example, uh, North Korean denuclearization. So managing relationship with China is important, but it must be based upon rock hard security relationship between Korea and the United States. That's something we have to tell the United States. That's something we have to tell the, tell the Chinese so that there will be no mistake. There will be no miscalculation. <coughs> Ambassador Stevens, she talked about, say, driving a wedge. I mean, China uh, try, trying to drive a wedge in the relationship between Korea and the United States. The more ambiguous we, we are, the more temptation the Chinese will be in order to drive the wedge between Korea and the United States. So, by coming up with principled position, we in fact can reduce the temptation of the Chinese to drive the wedge between Korea and the, Korea and the United States. Ambassador Stevens also talked about that. And when that issue came up, again, people, I mean, some people in, in, in Korea, they try to approach it with this strategic ambiguous position. I said, no. Why? Because, well, that in fact cannot res resolve this very different perspective we have. Why do we need that? So what I've been telling my Chinese, Chinese colleagues was this, which is look at North Korea. Well, it is, 
in fact believed to have between 20 to 60 nuclear wires. But that's not all. They, in fact, ha have a lot of chemical weapons. They, in fact, have a, a lot of biological weapons. They have delivery systems. And then this, in fact, is a core national interest for Korea. With all of that in line in North Korea, if we do not have sufficient anti-missile system, then which, in fact, would be able to defend us against all those nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons. So you Chinese, you talk, often talk about core national interest. This, in fact, is our core national interest. So in other words, I think, given the relationship between the United States and China for the time being, I think it is extremely important for Korean government in particular to, in fact, uh, base its foreign policy upon a rock hard principled position. You know, Ambassador Ahn and, and, and Ambassador Stevens, you want to take the same question afterwards? Uh, you, you mentioned you're a proponent of a, of a more principled approach, um, uh, which you know, I suppose is very admirable. And I, and I suppose, uh, you know, I suppose it's, it's one shared by, you know, a lot of people in foreign service of, of both nations. But uh, we've largely talked about the external impact uh, effect of China. When it comes to internal human rights issues, whether it be a million plus Uyghurs, uh, you know, in re-education camps over the years for Xinjiang province, or the kind of repression going on in Hong Kong, or what happens with followers of Falun Gong. Um, do you think for the United States and the Republic of Korea to make a committed effort and kind of chastisement of China to press the issue of human rights in China, that do you think that would be effective? Or for China, they see it as such vital core ideological issues for them that they will disregard any pressure from the outside? Uh, well, I, I mean, it's certainly my view that that both the United States and South Korea, uh, we do have to, I, I mean, I'm talking about principles. I mean, I would talk about values. Um, I do think that our, uh, you know, the, the legitimacy of our alliance and of our leadership in the world is based on a number of things, but one is the sense that we do represent certain values. Now, but the question you ask is, is a good one and is what, what you know, is, makes diplomacy so challenging is, how can we be effective? I mean, I am I am not a proponent of of just banging a drum and doing things to make ourselves feel better. I do think that it's important we be very clear, uh, but I think we, we we do have to look at what the what the issue is and think about. I mean, in some ways, I think diplomacy is a little bit like medicine: the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. I don't want to do things that are going to harm the prospects for some improvement in Hong Kong or, or some addressing the situation in Xinjiang in some way. But I do want to, to, do, to in a principle, you know, values way to try to mobilize the international community. And again, this is where I think if, if the U.S. just speaks out with one voice, it's much easier for the Chinese to say it's just the U.S. You know, going after us. If we can have a coalition of like-minded voices who, who do speak out in international fora in a variety of ways, who mobilize civil society and who do come up with some approaches that uh, that that might might show that there is some cost for this, and we are prepared to take some action. I mean, uh, when it comes to Hong Kong, I mean, I would like to see you're not really asking, but I, I I would like to see us do more to to ensure that people who are uh, suffering uh, from the repression that's being imposed in Hong Kong have some options to leave. I think we need to be. And I, I can't speak for South Korea, but you know, I think again we share some some considerable you know concerns there. Uyghurs very challenging, but we have a long history in uh, South Korea and the United States of working together in the UN, of working together in the G20, of working together in a whole variety of fora. I think we have to mobilize those and 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 also think about some kinds of sanctions. But I, I think we have to be. I, I you know I, I take your point too though. Sorry to go on long, but you see it engages me. We can't sort of just pretend that if we go out and say something, it's all going to change. Uh, we do have to balance it. We have, to, but I, I, but we are, our voice is, is stronger. Our actions are more likely to have some impact if we can have a strong coalition of partners speaking in a concerted way. Maybe slightly different. You know, South Korea may have a reason why it needs to wants to emphasize a little bit more on this side than that side. That's okay. But we have to. We have to. The, the bedrock principles have to be have to be clear. And Ambassador, on I suppose you know, similar question. 
Uh, do you think a, a principled and kind of more forceful approach to human rights, domestic human rights uh, issues would be effective with China? And especially say if it led to sign kind of, uh, you know, economic sanctions or, or repercussions, it might be more difficult for South Korea than the United States. Uh, how do you think it would be received in South Korea? Well, earlier this evening, I talked about, uh, say, liberal global order. I mean, how Korea as a nation, we benefited from the, the, the liberal global order, which in fact been, has been designed and supported by the United States. And when I say liberal global order, one key component of the liberal global order is respect for human rights. And uh, in that respect, I think there is no question what position Korea must be taken with respect to the to, to this whole, wholly important issue of protection of human rights in Korea, but around the whole world. Having said that, I was listening very closely to Ambassador Stevens, and then we co didn't coordinate our position before. But at the same time, I couldn't agree more with Kathy when she said coalition of partners. And, and then with respect to Korea, then it, it is not only partner, we are a treaty ally, coalition of allies. And where uh, Ambassador Stevens also talked about all those multilateral forums uh, in which we worked together, like G20. And uh, when it comes to President-elect Biden, he, in fact, has been saying for a long time that, in fact, uh, very early in his presidency, he is going to host a summit of democracy. And I think it's a very, very, very relevant idea. Why do I say that? It's because even during my time as ambassador in Washington, D.C., we were just beginning to be concerned in the sense that, well, earlier on this evening, then I talked about this uh, end of history and democracy, in fact, is respected as a political, political thought. But at the same time, in practice, it is being undermined in all different parts of the world. That's a reality. So that, in fact, an observation we already had during my time in Washington, D.C. So that is the reason why among Washington-based ambassadors, we started a process called D10, Democracy 10. And then D, of course, stands for democracy, and 10 stands for the number of partners. And D, uh, 10, included G7 plus European Union, Korea, and Australia. So we were already, already uh, be conscious of it in the sense that the like-minded uh, countries must get together to protect the values, which in fact uh, lie at the very, very basis of our democracies, liberal democracies. So that in fact is, is, is an idea lying around. These days, uh, Prime Minister Johnson of UK, he also is talking about the 10 So somehow it is from all different corners of the world that they are coming with, with a similar idea all at the same time. If it is happening all at the same time, maybe it is about the time that it should be started. And I think D10 would be a very good for or, or, or a summit of democracy would be a very good forum from which, as uh, as Ambassador Stevens rightly pointed out, we could in fact come up with something credible and relevant with respect to how to strengthen the protection of human rights as well as democracy. So relatively quickly, uh, I'm, and then I'm going to turn. We where if if any of you have audience questions, feel free to type them in now. Um, you know, it's basically starting in the '90s, and you know, Bush 43 through Clinton, the Bush 43 and Obama, and 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 on to uh, Trump through different tactics and strategies from the American perspective, or uh, a more um, kind of strong-handed approach from a Korean perspective, or the Sunshine Policy. You know, unfortunately. Uh, the combination of efforts has not been successful, obviously, and North Korea remains a nuclear-powered regime. Uh, what do, uh, maybe I'll start, at Ambassador Stevens and then Ambassador Ahn, both of you have incredible experience with regards to the issue of North Korea and negotiations. What do you think is realistic in terms of uh, the possibilities for North Korea to, to denuclearize? Right. Well, I would just uh, uh, add on to what you said, Ronan, by, by observing that, in fact, it's gotten worse, right? <laughs> uh, the challenge is much more difficult than it was uh, in the George H.W. Bush uh, uh, administration when, uh, and the Clinton administration uh, when, in fact, North Korea had not yet tested a nuclear device, and there was already some concern about it, but they had not even yet crossed that threshold, and then they've continued to cross thresholds uh, until now. Um, they certainly have a, a, a nuclear and missile capability, which is considerable, although 
and we don't recognize them as a nuclear weapon state. The reality is it's much harder. I think, you know, I, I, I think we have to, to learn from hard experience. Um, I think we have to uh, be realistic. And, uh, but I think what we, we have seen, and I don't think that's changed, we've seen it as recently as in the Trump administration, that um, there is no appetite, nor do I have one, for uh, risking war to try to uh, denuclearize. Uh, and I think there are ways in which we can continue to strengthen our defense and deterrence while trying to, and again, this is the work of diplomacy and politics, through pressure and incentives, get North Korea into a process, and it will be a long, drawn out, unsatisfying, easy to criticize process that will begin to reduce the threat and eventually get them onto a road away from nuclear weapons and towards a more reasonable semblance of a life for the 20 million North Koreans there who have all the aspirations and hopes that South Koreans, you know, did 50 years ago. So, you know, it's nothing grand and, and it's, it's a long-term project. But the other thing I would add is just, what does it take? It takes Seoul and Washington working as closely as possible. And it also takes, it's sometimes easier said than done, even though we've talked about what a great alliance we have. We have different perspectives. And two, it does involve the region. And the rest of the world. So again, I guess I would say we've got to. You know, this is not. I mean, the Hello? not sure. Uh, I think Ambassador Stevens might have dropped out. Um, Ambassador on, um, maybe it's the, a, a similar question. And um, you know, also, I'll just to, to add a question from the audience. Uh, someone asked, would the, do you think the new what Biden has done? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I think we lost you for a moment, but we're, we got you back. Uh, Ambassador on is going to uh, turn to a similar question, related question. From Do you think that uh, the Biden policy uh, will, will, I suppose, Biden administration will ease tensions between the United States and North Korea? And are you supportive of a declaration uh, to the end of the war of the Korean, Korean Peninsula, even if it's without a complete denuclearization agreement? Well, let me first respond to the declaration of end of the war, declaration of the end of the war on the Korean Peninsula. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, we must think about the implication of that. What would be the implication of the declaration at the end of the war on the Korean Peninsula? And then that, in fact, has a long story behind it. It goes back to 2005 and then to 2006. And then when it was first discussed between Korea and the United States, what we suggested was, well, this is one of the tools we could use in order to make North Korea to denuclearize. So it was considered as a tool. And then what was North Korean position at the time? It was, well, if you give it to me for free, then I'm interested in it. But at the same time, if do I, if uh, do I if I have to pay price for that, then I'm not interested. So that, in fact, was our position. When I say our, then Korean and the U.S. position uh, back in 2005, 2006, and then North Korean position. And I think there is no change so far. North Korea would be saying, "Well, if you give it for free, then I'm interested." But at the same time, if you want me to pay any price, I'm not interested. Well, given such a situation, I don't think it is a good idea to give it to, to North Korea. Having said that, let me get back to the main question, which is, what about North Korea? North Korean nuclear issue. And then what should be the new, uh, say, administration, Biden as administration should be doing with respect to North Korean nuclear issue? That, in fact, would be something which would have to undergo rather intense review by the incoming administration. Uh, but I think there would be two issues to be addressed. One, what should be the objective? Two, what should be the methodology? And then when it comes to objective, what I think is this, which is that the one word which comes up in my mind with respect to objective would be strength of objective. And then when it comes to strength of objective, well, there is no question about how strong North Korea is to, the, to develop nuclear weapons. It, in fact, is ready to give up the lives of hundreds of millions, uh, hundreds of thousands of its own people just in order to realize this, this dream 
of emerging as a nuclear state. It is as strong as that. And then what, in fact, should, we, should be the objective, strength of the objective we have? Unless we, in fact, have equally strong uh, objective, sense of uh, objective, I think we, we in fact, would, be, would not be there to, to achieve the denuclearization of North Korea. So when it comes to objective, I think there, is, there, is, there cannot be any other objective than CVID. Uh, that is a complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization of North Korea. Having said that, it is not the objective of uh, Korea and the United States alone. That, in fact, is an objective which, in fact, has been declared again and again through all those Security Council resolutions uh, go going back to going back to 2006. So that is the objective. We must have strong sense of objective, clarity of purpose. Methodology. I was listening to Ambassador Stevens. Again, I agree with her in the sense that well, a military option would not would not be well something something recommend, recommendable. Secretary Mattis, the Secretary of Defense of the United States under President Trump, he used to say this, which is, "Are you considering military option?" And then to that question, he always said, "Well, in fact, everything is on the table, but at the same time, there are so many things we could do before we come there." And I, I used to like that that answer. And then for the time being, I think economic sanction works fine. And then economic sanction, which in fact began to be introduced through UN Security Council resolutions beginning from March 2016, there was Security Council resolution 2270. And then from there, then we began to impose ban on the export of uh, iron ores and export of coal, ex export of fishery stuff, export of textiles, export of expatriate workers. So, well, all those resolutions in fact worked very effectively as a kind of incentive for North Korea to come to the negotiating table, which in fact North Korea did back in 2018 and 2019. But we have to admit that in fact, uh, those economic sanctions to be effective, then that in fact must be implemented sufficiently. But that sufficient implement implementation is always a big question if we are having it, particularly because of China in the sense that 90%, well, not more than 90% of economic exchange of North Korea with the external world. It is being done with China. And even recently, there was a report saying this year alone, well, between, between China and North Korea, they, they, they in fact had more than, say, $400 million worth of trade in, uh, in court alone. So that, in fact, is the first thing we, we must look into, how to further strengthen this effectiveness of uh, economic sanction on North Korea. Definitely, I think it will work. And there is a saying, sanction works, uh, sanction doesn't work until it works. I believe in that. Okay. And, and thank you both very much. I mean, obviously, we could, we could talk for two or three hours easily and still have plenty to, to discuss. Um, but maybe just lastly, I, I know it's, it's a hard thing to be brief about. But uh, Ambassador Stevens and Ambassador On the same uh, position. Uh, could you maybe each just talk about kind of what you hope or maybe expect to see with regards to the uh, Republic of Korea and the U.S.'s relationship under the the you know coming Biden administration? Mm. Um. Yeah, I I, I think uh, President Elect Biden has has already set out some pretty clear uh, over uh, overarching uh, notions strengthening, or as I think he sometimes talks about, restoring alliances, uh, multilateralism, uh, the importance of a return to some values, uh, democracy and human rights, and, uh, and the notion that uh, uh, America's sort of international uh, uh, efforts are going to have to be underpinned by uh, efforts here at home to address some of our issues. So uh, we've kind of touched on all those things uh, today, which is what makes me think that the U.S. South Korea relationship is going to be something that is is going to play a, a pretty large role in the Biden agenda. Now, this may, I mean, on the one hand, I think South Korea may be sort of relieved that uh, there are some of the more unconventional Trump approaches, like uh, uh, quintupling of the uh, uh, of the contribution demanded from uh, uh, Korea for the stationing of troops, uh, will be replaced by a more, if you like, bureaucratic and gradualist process. But on the other hand. 
I think Biden is actually going to kind of expect more of South Korea uh, because he does think a lot allies are so important. So I think, uh, you know, Korea may be, feel a little squeezed along some of the grounds that uh, some of the lines that Ambassador Ahn was talking about, uh, especially when it comes to some of these very delicate issues having to do or not so delicate, but really glaring issues having to do with China. So um, but I think that the uh, the emphasis on alliances is like the, the, the sort of number one thing that that Mr. Biden talks about. Uh, so I think we have to see how that plays out with Korea. But but yeah, North Korea, China uh, will, will be high on the list and uh, it's, a, it's a big portfolio. So I think the other anxiety in, 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 in South Korea is how much attention will there be to it and all of that. But I think I think we'll see that there is attention. <laughs> Ambassador on, if you can, I suppose, you know, briefly, I suppose the, the same question. Oh, right. Mr. O'Malley, uh, from time to time, I, I, I tell myself about the world with United U.S. leadership. And then the world without United, without without United yeah, U.S. leadership, and then and then I think the answer would be obvious. The world with U.S. leadership is something we experienced over, over the past seventy years. And then we thought this world with uh, with the U.S. leadership that in fact provided us with an opportunity for peace, uh, stability, and prosperity. The question would be this: which is the why? Why is it that all the U.S. presidents, beginning from uh, beginning from President Truman all the way down to, to presidents we have today. Why did they subscribe themselves to this belief that the United States must continue to play the leadership role? There is one expression which, uh, which President Clinton made rather famous, which is, even after the Cold War, the United States must continue to be an indispensable nation. I really appreciate it when he first began to talk about the 1995. And why? Why United States presidents, beginning from all the way from President Truman all the way down to uh, where the presidents we have today, why did they subscribe themselves to this belief that the United States must continue to play the leadership role for peace and stability in the international community? Yes, maybe there was, there was a motivation. But at the same time, because U.S. presidents believe that, in fact, is the best way to ensure the peace and prosperity of the United States as a nation, so it was a win-win. The leadership role to be played by the United States, I think it was a win-win strategy for the United States and for the world. And then what we are hearing from President Biden is precisely that. What he is saying is, United States is back. And when, when he says United States is back, what does it mean? Back to where United States must play this leadership role. We, in fact, I mean, I, in fact, as a diplomat, Diplomat of 40 years. I, in fact, feel greatly relieved and ready to work with the United States. Now, I listen to Ambassador Stevens. In fact, Mr. Biden, his, uh, his, uh, well, request list could be even larger and, and, and then stronger. Well, I welcome that. We look at that and then, and then keep on, keep on working up, up, on, up on that. And then, and then that's precisely why I said, U.S. Alliance, U.S. Korea alliance, it must be global part. It, in fact, has developed into global partnership, must continue to develop as a global partnership. A great uh, summary, and, and I suppose optimistic look forward from both of you. Uh, and again, I just wanted to expend our, our special thank you uh, to the, uh, the, the Consulate General of the Republic of Korea here in Houston uh, for sponsoring this event, and in particular, Consul General Ahn and uh, Consul Chung. Um, thank you to everyone there here in Houston, and thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Ahn, Ambassador Stevens. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here this evening, and, and <laughs> Ambassador Ahn, for very early in the morning in Seoul, and perhaps some point next year we can have you, you both in person in Houston. Thank you all very much, and have a great, great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.